Imagine this in the 1900s. You're a designer at American Locomotive Company. The person for Union Pacific comes up and asks for you to improve their design of the 2102 Santa Fe's that they use. You sit down at your drawing board and you think, what if there was an animal I could base it off of? We think of a locomotives as living creatures. If I were to base it off an animal, what would it be? Oh, I know. A fucking millipede. Hello and welcome to Where Would Explain. This is where I talk about trains, their history, mechanics, and more. And today, we're talking about the UP9000 series. These were a set of 4122 heavy freight locomotives introduced in 1926 and served on a railroad with, surprisingly, decent success. So, let's go over the history of these locomotives and see how, some, how something so unconventional became somewhat successful. In the 1920s, the Union Pacific needed more power on the line between Cheyenne and Ogden. The 2880 Malay locomotives they had were powerful, but they could not go at high speeds, and for most of, for for the most part, were regulated to help with service. The 2102 Santa Fe's on the line were faster, but they could not haul nearly as much. UP wanted to have a new locomotive that could run on the line with faster, f faster with more efficiency, and did not have to be and that could haul a lot more tonnage. At the time, both the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific went to Alco for a locomotive. Alco were close worked with Union Pacific. Southern Pacific at some point did drop out, but they were Alco worked continued to work with Union Pacific. They decided to stretch the 2102 design. Originally, they were going to keep it 10 driving wheels. However, part of the design change was a third cylinder. So, a little bit of explanation behind this: a normal steam locomotive, whether it be articulated or some or rigid frame generally has the cylinders on the outside and in that case we still it's it's considered somewhat a little bit of a two cylinder locomotive yes the big boy for instance has four sets of cylinder has four sets of cylinders however they're still all outside the frame the third cylinder concept but the third cylinder in the frame between the two two normal cylinders on top of the front drop on top of the front truck so this was oh it was always in the front of the locomotive and always help turn at power the axles from the inside kind of like how some British locomotives used inside cylinders however um, however we took it to a different level instead of having two cylinders on the inside or two cylinders on the outside it's three two cylinders on the outside one on the inside it was connected to the other cylinders of the rocker arm and so it could also the, the outside cylinders could help control the inner cylinder. It was set at an 8 degree angle to clear the front, the front axle, and the second axle was pushed back slightly. Because of, because of the weight of the third cylinder, it necessitated a two axle front truck. Alco went with the Grayslee valve gear since it was thought that that would be the best way to operate the third cylinder. Alco built a test engine, a 4102 number 8000, for testing of the whole concept. UP received it in 1925, and put it on the lines to test it. Locomotive had trouble on tight turns, but that is expected of a wheel of a locomotive with such a long wheelbase. However, the biggest thing was high maintenance cost. You could not access the third cylinder very easily. You could access some parts from getting underneath, you can access some parts from the front, however, vast majority you just had to straight up take the boiler off. UP also found that with the ten driving wheels, the third cylinder provided a bit too much power. So they went back to Alco and asked for another set of driving wheels. In April 1926, Alco delivered the first 4122 number 9000 to UP. Number 9000 was built was built and designed within a year after UP went back to them with results from number 8000. The Union Pacific put it through its paces and liked the locomotive. It was powerful, it was very efficient, and it did what it wanted to do. Obviously, it couldn't operate in mountainous terrain or urban areas because there the tracks were a little bit more tighter. However, across the flat plains where the where the track where the tracks had gentle curves, they performed really, really well. 
third song that considered cons- considerably still was a maintenance hog. Costs were pretty high for the locomotive. However, Union Pacific decided that it was worth it. The company bought 87 more locomotives, and the last one was delivered in 1930. The engine sound is very unique. Normally, when you think of a regular steam locomotive, you normally think the one and two and one and two and one and two and one and two. Uh, with because of the third cylinder of this locomotive, in this locomotive, it has a unique one two three 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 B to it. The 9000s very quickly took over high speed freight surface on the on the flats. They were 80% more efficient than previous locomotives and could pull roughly 100 to 125 cars at 50 miles an hour. At some point, Alco modified 8 of the 9000 series on changes. You'll notice on the original locomotive, it had the air compressors mounted on the front of the smoke box. The modified 8 had them placed on the side. Said 8 would also receive Walshirt's valve gear instead of the Grayslee valve gear. These eight locomotives would be known as bald face nines. On the Grayslee valve gear, the friction bearings were the biggest weakness of the 9000s since they wore out really quickly. If worn out, they could cause incorrect timing of the cylinders, which you could count someone see is a big problem. Roller bearings would eventually replace the friction bearings. Other modifications over time reduced maintenance costs, so as much as the third cylinder was still an issue, it wasn't nearly as bad to a certain extent. The 9000s would proudly serve the UP until the dieselization age. Even after the challengers and big boys took over ha- ha- much of their mountain t- mountainous terrains and d- significant amount of freight traffic, 9000s were still used for everything. It is very it's very surprising. Most locomotives you could of that size you would imagine won't be exactly as successful. The triplexes were not successful. The Russian train with 14 driving wheels wasn't exactly successful. For that matter, the 10 driving wheel concept was questionable for some railroads. Some railroads obviously extremely liked them, but others it was questionable. And yet, Union Pacific somehow had 88 of of these 412-2s and managed, and managed to use them quite nicely. Now, operators just say they, ro- they weren't the smoothest ever, but however, they were very powerful. And you just have to be careful on the corners. Thankfully, number 9000, the first uh, the first locomotive, survived. She's currently at the Real Giants Museum in Pomona, California. Every so often, they'll put compressed air through the whistle, and to this day, they still let her sing. <laughs> It's a very, very high-pitched whistle, similar to, similar to I th- believe, the Santa Fe's that the Union Pacific ran. After that, the, the 800 series, Challengers, and the big boys used a deeper three-chime whistle, I believe. When it comes to uniqueness, these locomotives are very unique. It really is impressive that they managed to successfully use them for many years, and the fact that one of them still survives to this day. Not a lot of people know about this locomotive outside a lot of Union Pacific fans and, for the most part, Amer- Americans. A lot of European country, European railroad fans don't know about this locomotive, even if they are into Amer- American railroad stuff. So, I thought this was such an interesting locomotive, such an interesting design, and such actually somewhat interesting history about it. So... I really thought this one deserved a video.
I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, really lo love making this one. Uh, footage was a uh, bit hard to get because there wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, but it was really fun otherwise. In the next video, I'll be doing a a overview on Union Pacific's retirement plan of two steam locomotives and a few other equipment to a railroad museum with a special announcement on, on what the museum is planning on doing with that. Hope you all have a pleasant day. I'll see you in the next one.